This morning I take us back to our series in 1 Corinthians. We are at chapter 12 and considering the first 11 verses. The message today is 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11, titled Spiritual Gifts Are For Today. I encourage you to look this up in your Bible or the Bible you have on your digital device. Follow along. The Apostle Paul wrote, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation, manifestation of the Spirit for common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Well, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Christianity brings some of the most amazing experiences. Uh, for me, it was an experience when I gave my life to Christ. Now, experiences vary from one to another. Some people make just a very calculated, I decide now to give my life to Christ. Others come out of a life that's just nothing but a shipwreck or a train wreck. When they give their life to the Lord, it's very emotional, and they feel all that weight coming off of them. But all that to say, becoming a Christian is experiential. The scripture calls it being regenerated. There's other experiences in the Lord, what we call uh, those of us who are doctrinally inclined, we call it sanctifying grace. That is, all along our journey in Christ, we find the Lord showing up, so to speak, and giving us the strength to make it through that day, or through that task, or through that challenge. Sometimes we're not even aware of what he's doing until we look in the rearview mirror. And we say, wow, God was there all along. He was carrying me, holding my hand. We have the experience of eternal assurance. If you've ever sinned and wiped out before God and had to come to him with your head bowed and really dragging in spirit saying, Lord, I've messed up one more time, only to find out his answer to you is my grace is sufficient. He's God of mercy. He always forgives. He keeps you in fellowship. He's not a tyrant of a father who loves you only when you perform. But he's a loving father that loves you always, even when you mess up. I love those experiences. I love the experience I have in being, being aware of the hope. When I was a younger man, this didn't resonate with me too much. I knew it doctrinally. We have a hope in Christ. But the older I get, the more that hope becomes real to me. You know that hope, that, that expectation, that knowledge that in the end everything's going to be fine. Even the end of my days will be fine. I find myself singing that hymn, I'll cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Those were just words in my early days of Christianity. Now they're packed with meaning for me. Not that I plan to exit. Don't worry, you're stuck with me. <laughs> but uh, the point of it is, there's the experience of just knowing that I know that I know I'm okay. Because Jesus said he's going to take me there, not because I've earned my way there. We enjoy a personal faith whereby we know that we know that we know Jesus is real. Amen. You know, I'm not much of a debater. You might be able to out-debate me on whether or not Christianity is true and there is a God. There are people that are skilled in philosophy and debate. 
But one thing you can never take away from me is this, I know, I know that I know. The hymn writer said, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. That's enough for me. It's real. Jesus is real. Another amazing experience in Christianity is when we stand by and watch the Holy Spirit use us to accomplish God's will. It never ceases to amaze me how the Holy Spirit just works through me, works through you, works through his believers to see the will of God accomplished. And sometimes he uses my talents, and sometimes he uses my just ability to show up and volunteer. But oftentimes he uses me to do things that I don't have talents for, and I didn't sign up for, but it's just all of a sudden the ability is there. It's a supernatural working in my life, and it happens to you. And that's what Paul is talking about here. There are experiences in your life where the Holy Spirit will use you to do things you don't know how to do, use you to do things you don't have a talent for, or you may not even have a natural inclination to do it or interest in it. But he will supernaturally equip you to do it. That very phenomena is called spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit has something called spiritual gifts that work through us. Now, what are spiritual gifts? Well, it's the way God works through us in profound ways to accomplish what we don't have the natural ability to do. I'll, I'll brag about my son here. Um, when he was 11, 10, 11 years old, he, I put my guitar in his hands and he wasn't interested. I thought, well, okay, He's, everybody's wired differently. And about 12 years old, he was about 12 years old, I came in the living room and he had my guitar in his hand and he was fidgeting around with it. And uh, he said, I want one of these. <laughs> so I made a deal with him. If you learn the names of the head, the body, the neck, the pick guard, and things like that, and you can learn the names of the strings, we'll go down to the music store and get you a guitar. Well. Within a few hours, he had that down, so I had to go to the music store. And we got to the music store, he said, I don't want no junk. <laughs> so he pulled out of his pocket $75 he had been saving and earned as a kid, you know, doing odd jobs around mowing grass and things like that. So, you know, I, I kept that $75 and put it away. But we got him a, a nice little guitar. Not a high end, but something that wouldn't frustrate him. Oh, within a few weeks, I put my guitar away and just felt like burning it because he was just, he just soared. Uh, he said to me in church one day, I want to learn to play piano. Show me how to do it. Well, I don't play piano, but I understand the keyboard. So I sat with him and I said, here's a C and here's how you build a C chord. See, see the intervals, one, two, three, four, five, you count it out, see. He said, okay, and he's doing this. And I go to the office, he's there about an hour later, I come back and he's playing Amazing Grace. And he's figured out the chords. All that to say, my son is a gifted, talented musician. Uh, he has toured Europe with his band. Um, he um, is a, a very proud of the recordings and things he's done, and just a... I don't, I quit playing music with him when he was 12 and a half because I couldn't <laughs> keep up. He thought I was too busy. No, it was dad's ego. <laughs> but uh, the talent is just amazing in him. Again, when he was 12, 13 years old, he became one of the first piano players in our church. He was carrying the song service as an adolescent for a church that was, it was a large church. I don't want to go into numbers. It was a large church and he carried it. That's not spiritual gifting. That's a talent. You have talents too. Some of you are talented to build things, to cook things, to sew things, to do this, to do that. It makes sense to you. When you look at it, I can do that, and what you produce is just a, a, a work of art. It's really good. That's a talent God gave you. Some of you say, well, I'm not a woodworker, but you need someone to frame. Show me where to pound the nail, and I'll do it. You sign up, and you, and you volunteer, and you can do okay at it. Most of us can do okay about anything we put our hand to if we work at it. 
but then the talent really emerges. But there's something different about a spiritual gift. Do you remember Andre Crouch? Mm -hmm. yeah. Soon and very soon, we are going, going to see, see the king. king. Remember that song? I loved Andre Crouch's music. Went to one of his concerts as a young Christian. Just loved it to death. What an amazing, amazing man. Andre Krauss told us his testimony in a concert I went to. He said, I knew a little bit about piano. I figured out some chords and I would do this. And one day in church, my dad, who was the pastor, said, Andre, the piano player can't come today, so you sit down and play. And he said, I could do this, but I didn't know really what I was doing. And he said, I sat at the piano and looked at those keys and all of a sudden, it all made sense, and he just took off and began playing. A spiritual gift, I'm convinced. The Holy Spirit called him. Years later, I heard Andre Crouch talking again. He said, you know, I went through a real dry season in my life where you might say I backslid and started walking away from the Lord. I knew better, but I just had been burned out and this and that and started drifting, and I sat down at the piano, and it was like I was a little boy. I couldn't understand it. It's like he had lost it. He quickly got his life back right with God, and it all came back again. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. See, there are talents. My son has a talent. But Andre Crouch, I believe, had a spiritual gift. The Holy Spirit empowered him. I've been amazed through the years how someone who said, I could never be a school teacher shows up with a Sunday school lesson plan, goes in and just bowls the students over and is the greatest thing going. Because it's nothing more than the gifting of the Holy Spirit that allows them to teach and do miraculously in their teaching and get results. Paul says that we are to understand in spiritual gifts. They are very important. His opening words are this in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be uninformed. Therefore, he said to the church, he says to us, we are to understand what spiritual gifts are and just how important they are. We've got to be aware of them and we need to be used in them. And these verses I just shared with you, these first 11 verses, introduces several chapters on spiritual gifts. But these verses provide a foundation of understanding what they are. Now, if we grasp that understanding, uh, we'll be more apt to recognize when the Holy Spirit is up to using gifts in ministry, and we'll be more apt to give place for these spiritual gifts in our church, in our midst. So let's be aware of them. Let me uh, talk first to you, first of all, to you about the nature of of spiritual gifts. And I go to verses 1 to 3 on this, the very nature of them. Paul, in his language, says, now concerning the charismata. Now, you've heard that word charismata because we belong to a denomination at one time called the Charismatic Episcopal Church, and we consider ourselves by identity Christians who are charismatic. That's because we are Christians who value the importance of spiritual gifts in our midst. But isn't it interesting that Paul calls them charismata? Charis means grace in his language. Charismata is a grace word, meaning this, that those spiritual gifts are the workings of the Holy Spirit. They come out of the very cross of Jesus Christ. Charis means grace. It's translated as grace. Charismata is grace workings. Now, concerning the grace workings of the Holy Spirit, I'm reminded, you remember we just had it in uh, Ephesians in our reading of the New Testament, that when Jesus ascended, he gave gifts unto men. Through his ascension, spiritual gifts came down to us through the Holy Spirit. Gifts themselves are a work of God's grace. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. Spiritual gifts, though they come from the Holy Spirit, are rooted in what Jesus did on the cross. Therefore, Paul says in verse 3, everything about spiritual gifts always points to Jesus, nothing else. He says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 
when a, when a spiritual gift is in operation in your life, in the church's ministry, in the church's worship service, it is always, always, always pointing to Jesus Christ. If a spiritual gift is ever presented to say, look at me, look how spiritual I am, the Holy Spirit is using me, you better believe that's not the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit always points us to Jesus Christ and the workings of spiritual gifts always exalt Jesus Christ. Something else we find here in these verses about the nature of gifts is we don't own them. They're not ours. They reside in the Holy Spirit. Even though we may be used frequently in them, we do not own them. You know, if I owned spiritual gifts, I would spend all my time in the hospital going from room to room if I had the gifts of healing. And many of you don't know this, but St. Agnes Hospital frequently calls me. Uh, when the chaplains are on, not on duty in the middle of the night and someone's passing away in ICU or ER or whatever, they need a pastor to come. And I don't know how they got my name, but the nurses got my name and now I'm on speed dial. So oftentimes at 2 in the morning, 4 in the morning, I'm on my way to St. Agnes and I sit with the family and minister to <coughs> them and the person who's in the throes of death and take them through that process and stay afterwards and counsel. And it's become uh, more frequent um, than you would imagine. There's so many times when I've seen that person in that bed on their way uh, out of this mortal life, and I deal with the pain in the family's faces I see, I would say, oh Lord, I wish I had the gift of healing right now. I would just say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And uh, the Lord ministers those gifts according to his plan and his determinations. I do not own the gifts of gifts. Have I prayed for the sick and they've been healed? That's happened in my ministry. It's happened for you too. How many times you prayed for a friend or a loved one or someone in church and laid hands on someone and found out that things turned around and you have to say, that was God. God has used us. But we can't say we own that gift. I don't own the gift of prophecy. The Lord may use me to speak a word on his behalf. I just can't go around saying what I want to, claiming that's prophetic. I don't own the gift of faith, though I have faith. Whenever we're in a situation where we need great faith, I don't say, hey, don't, hey, just look at me. I've got it. It's in the can right here. The Holy Spirit gave it to me back in 1978. I got it. It's right, just pull it up right now here. I got the faith. Let's go for it. It doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit owns these gifts. They are not resident in us, and they are not for our own personal gain. Simon the Sorcerer learned that when he tried to buy them. Hmm. Boy, did he ever get in trouble. But here's something I want to point out to you. Spiritual gifts are at work in our midst, whether we recognize them or not. I've been with pastors and attended churches throughout my ministry. They don't believe in spiritual gifts. Oh, no, no, those all ceased when the last apostle died. Well, really, how do you explain that Sunday school teacher down there that's untrained, but you gave a book to her, and she went in, and now she's winning people to the Lord and really making a difference in their life? You can't tell me that's not the Holy Spirit. We don't believe in spiritual gifts. Have you ever prayed for someone who's been sick, and all of a sudden they got better? See, the Holy Spirit is at work because we are the body of Christ and he's working whether we recognize him or not. And my thesis to you today is Paul says, don't be ignorant of what the spirit is doing. When you are aware, you say, wow, you give greater place and you give permission, so to speak, for the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. So we need to be aware of it. So spiritual gifts are needed, folks. You know, the physical realm really reflects what's going on in the spiritual realm around us. And we must arm ourselves with spiritual weapons. If you haven't figured this out yet, you're in a battle all the time with the forces of evil. And we really need the empowering work of God's Spirit to fight all of that. Let's talk about how to use spiritual gifts. I haven't even told you what they are. There's several lists in the Bible, but let me just go to the root of this on their use. For one, this. One thing this. Uh, Paul says that we are to give 
everything over to the Lord for his use. Offer everything. Everything about you, give it to him for use. Listen to what he says. There are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. Okay, Lord, I'm available. You want to use me in a spiritual gift? Here I am. And there are varieties of service. Okay? I've got talents. I'll give them to you. And there are varieties of activities. But it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. You see, we are to expect God to use us no matter what's in play. Is it a spiritual gift? Is it a talent? Or is it, I just volunteer because there's nobody else to do it. Expect God to use you in it. We are to be available for meeting ministry needs all the time. Step forward and say, I believe God can use me in that spiritual gift. Step forward and say, I have an ability for that, a talent. And if you don't have anything, just step forward and say, I volunteer. But do all expecting God to use you. The Holy Spirit is the author of all gifts and distributes them according to the needs of the body. Um, so how are you more likely to be used? Well, be not ignorant, Paul says. Be aware of them. So think about these things. Read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And offer yourself, Lord, if you want to use me in some profound way, here I am. I sign up. I'm available. I want to tell you, we do a lot about this thing called, are you called of God to do a task? Or he's called to enter the ministry. Or you're called to teach a class. Or you're called to clean the church, or you're called to sacristy, or you're called to intercession, or you're called to this, and you're called to that. I want to tell you something. 90% of the call is just availability. Making yourself available is 90% of it. Then be sensitive to the needs around you. The best gifts are the ones most needed, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. And then be available. I had to tell you the story about a fellow I know. I don't know if he knows me, but I, I know of him. I've met him and talked with him um, through the years. His name is Owen Carr. You've probably never heard of Owen Carr. But Owen Carr pastored Stone Shirts in Chicago for years, and one day got a notion. Uh, this is way, way back in the 70s. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a Christian television station this is back early CBN days, PTL Network, before all that came out. So he went into Chicago and he started a Christian television station, Channel 38. Owen Carr had a very productive ministry, went on, was a college president, all kinds of things. Here's, here's where I'm going with this. Owen Carr was 90 years old, sitting at a Denny's with his other old codger friends. Can I get away with that? And uh, they're drinking coffee and eating their muffins or whatever, and they're complaining about how old the church is and what it was when we were young men. And we missed those old days. And they got, their group grew about seven, eight, nine fellows, all in their 80s. And one day, one fellow said to Owen Carr, who's 90 years old, You know, we ought to start a church. You could be the pastor. You know where I'm going with this? At age 90, those men started a church with Owen Carr as the pastor. Uh, he is nicknamed the Energizer Bunny, by, man, uh, by the way. That church started in 2006 with those five, six, seven, eight fellows. It's now running 400 in attendance. Owen Carr is still the pastor. And he's 108 years old. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You're now, never too old to serve He God. just shows up and preaches once a month. But he's still the pastor. <laughs> Don't tell me I'm too old to volunteer. <laughs> I'm too old to use my talents. I'm too old for spiritual gifts. You are never, ever, ever too old, too tired, too spent, to use for God to tap on your shoulder and say, step forward. Amen. Write this name down, Owen Carr, and Google it. 
You can fact check me on this. In my, use the real fact checks, not CNN and the rest of them. <laughs> the value of spiritual gifts. Well, wrap it up by going about the value of gifts. No, they are pretty normative when you look throughout the New Testament. It's the way the early church ministered. They expected God to use them. They were operational in the life of the church, and they were operational in the ministry, out winning people to the Lord. In the church, here's an example of a gift being used. Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that story? Mm -hmm. Peter looked at them and said, looked at Ananias and said, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. They will carry you out. He had a word of knowledge. His wife came in later with the same story about the land they had sold. He said, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, and they'll carry you out the way they did your husband. Drop that. Word of knowledge. I think of spiritual gifts in the marketplace with the slave girl before Paul in Acts chapter 16, discerning of spirits. He put up with it for a season, and one day looked at her and said, in the name of Jesus, come out of her right now, come out. Spiritual gifts belong in the church, and they belong in the marketplace. I'm reminded of a board member, a vestryman I had years ago, who took this to heart. Uh, Eller and I met him and his wife at a restaurant for lunch, or for, uh, yeah, it was for lunch. And we're standing there in line, waiting to go in, and his name was Dick. And we're just talking about the weather and everything else, waiting for our table, waiting for the line to process. He turns and starts talking to this girl beside him, and we continue our conversation. And before you know it, we hear Dick saying, I'm going to lay hands on you and pray for you. And right there, he starts praying for this woman to have a healing in her life and healing with her children. And I forget what all it was. And he did everything but get on his knees and speak in tongues. But he was right there, and as he was praying, he had prophetic insight. He was naming things going on in her life and naming things in her children's life. God was using a word of knowledge to penetrate this barrier. This woman began weeping as he prayed for her. Changed her life in that moment. While we're standing there talking about, are you going to get lasagna or spaghetti? <laughs> He's over here laying hands on a wounded person, a scared individual, and trusting God to be there to use him to meet her need in that moment. We went in and sat down and ate, and she kept getting up and coming over and talking to him. Then we go back and sit down, get up, come back and talk to him. She knew there was something real there. I propose to you that the charismata, spiritual gifts, the workings of the Holy Spirit, are not a nicety or an option. They are absolutely essential to taking ministry forward. It's the means by which Jesus continued his ministry on earth. You know, some people think that when he was hung on the cross, he paid the price and resurrected. We believe that. I'm not denigrating that at all. Of course he did. It's the center of our faith. But they believe that when that happened, all ministry ceased because Jesus left us and he went off. Do you know that Jesus never stopped doing ministry? Do you know how he does it now? Well, when he walked on earth, he has a physical body. He laid hands on the sick. He raised the dead. He spoke words of forgiveness. He physically went from place to place and people to people talking, preaching, and laying hands and calling off demons and everything else. Do you know he still does that, but not through his physical body, but through his mystical body, which is us. And I propose to you that spiritual gifts are just the mechanism or means by which Jesus continues doing his ministry. Now he's not limited to a 30-mile radius in Palestine or in Israel. Now he's worldwide through the likes of you and me. You are his arms, his legs, his head, his neck, his ankles, whatever you are, but he's using you, he has you, and you are continuing his ministry. I do want to make this point, and we'll close. Spiritual gifts can be messy. 
Now listen carefully to this. Do you remember the scripture that says, we have treasures in jars of clay? Do you remember that? 2 Corinthians 4, 7. What that means is this. Wherever you have divine, you have dirt. That's the way God works. There is divinity and a dirt mixture in each and every one of us. No matter how sold out we are to the Lord, no matter how spiritual we are in the Lord, we are still jars of clay, and there is always dirt in the mix. And we don't always get it right. We are fallible. We can make mistakes. That's no reason to kick us to the curb or say spiritual gifts aren't real. You can always use the wrong grammar when you're speaking for God. That doesn't mean God doesn't know grammar. It means he's working in earthen vessels. You may misspeak, get a word twisted, say something upside down or backwards, or even miss it or misunderstand it. You are a clay vessel. And that's why these are not infallible workings. I'll give you an example of that. God told Paul when he was converted, I will use you to speak before kings. The Lord spoke to Paul throughout his ministry. There's a day coming. Check me out on this. There's a day coming when you'll be in Rome before Caesar and the rest of them, that household, and you will be a witness for me. So Paul's on his way. He's been arrested. He's on his way to Rome, and he stops to see the believers along the way, and the prophet Agabus comes out and wraps his hands with a rope, and he says, Paul, Paul, if you go to Rome, you'll be bound. Word of the Lord. Paul already knew that. It's a confirmation. But here's what the church in Agabus did. Here's the dirt. Oh, don't go. <laughs> you shouldn't go. The prophetic word was an encouragement. Paul, you're doing the right thing. Even though you'll be bound, you're doing what I want you to do. But the dirt and divine is, here's the word, you'll be bound, but, and they interpreted it wrong. And sometimes we get wrong what God is speaking. We understand it wrong. So I, my word to you is this. Spiritual gifts are needed. They're amazing. They're a wonderful experience. Make yourself available. Expect God to do profound things through you. But listen, church, we are dirt and divinity and mixture and mistakes will be made, and we move on. I would rather you step out in faith and make a mistake than to sit there on your hands and never do anything. You will never be rebuked for making a mistake. Now, if you enjoy that mistake and keep doing it three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, then you'll have a conversation with me, and I will coach you, as they say in the Walmart world. <laughs> we will coach you. But uh, you hear my heart on that. That's the scripture. Always, always check the workings of the Spirit. Make sure they're in compliance with Scripture. Well, when you read the Bible with this kind of lens removed from your eyes, these kinds of lenses removed from your eyes, spiritual gifts become obvious. This is the way God wants to minister. By using all of us with the empowerment of His Spirit. But sometimes we can miss the obvious. You know, when we first moved here, we moved into the cottage. Uh, my wife and I, we said, what is wrong with the water pressure here? We called the shower the Chinese water torture. <laughs> and she was filling up buckets of water from the sink as it dribbled in to fill the washing machine. I mean, it was a little bit of pressure, but not much. And I thought, well, there's just much something wrong this cottages at the end of the water line and maybe, you know, we'll just uh, we'll just put up with it because we won't be here forever. The church has sold the property. We can move on. We can deal with this. And so she was, um, I didn't want to bother Lane because Lane's the type of guy, you say something, he's right there. And he just helps you all. I didn't want to bother and take advantage of it. So my wife was talking here one day after church about, you know, the Chinese water torture and our shower <laughs> and, you know, like drip <laughs> and uh, you had to dance around in there to get wet. <laughs> so Lane calls me one day and he says, um, Father Richard, have you ever turned the water on in the cottage? <laughs> now, that's a pretty obvious thing to look at, right? 
Wouldn't you think he would go to the water valve and see if it's turned on? <laughs> so I went in there and turned the water on. Full force, full. My next thing was, what am I going to tell Ellen? <laughs> I got to cover this somehow. Except she's right over my shoulder going, what? <laughs> what? The point of it is, you know, even we. What is obvious in front of us sometimes we can overlook. I mean, that is just in anybody who's ever owned a home or been in an apartment, you got length time. Guys, you know, if you don't have water pressure, the first thing you do is check the water, see if it's on. Listen, when it comes to things in the Bible, we sometimes miss the very obvious because we're looking everywhere else. Gifts are there, they're everywhere. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.